I will be reading to you from Exodus chapter 16. And um, this takes place after the Hebrews left Egypt. We've been looking at the life of Moses um, in recent weeks. And so I will start reading from verse, chapter, from verse 1, and I'll make some comments as um, we go along. So it begins, And they, that's the Israelites, journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. That, that word Sin there, it's not talking about what we call Sin. It's just the name of this um, wilderness. It says, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Wow, that's a strong comment for the Israelites to make. And the Israelites, they had a tendency to jump to the worst possible conclusion. Um, and poor Moses and poor Aaron, this was serious stuff. I mean, God had done so much for them. But here they are thinking that Moses had led them here in order to kill them with hunger. And so they go from zero to hundred quite quickly. And you see, this event that they were facing now, this crisis, was actually an opportunity for God to do something for them that they had never experienced before. And that's how we need to think about the challenges we face. We shouldn't jump to the worst possible conclusion, we should instead recognize and acknowledge that God is going to use this to his glory and that he's going to do something new in me. This is the kind of mindset we need to have. You see, God has not brought you this far to forsake you. Now, they came to Moses with a complaint. Everyone say complaint. But it is essential that we do not allow ourselves to be filled with a spirit of complaining. It's a very bad thing. And I have a better alternative to being filled with complaining. And I want to point it out to you from Psalm chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, where David writes the following. He said, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And so David, he didn't live in denial that there was a problem. He freely acknowledged that there was a problem. His troubles had increased because many who troubled him had increased. But in the next verse, verse 3, I want you to notice a very important word. Verse 3, the first word is, but. Everyone say, but. So he says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. And so, yes, he acknowledged the problem, but he didn't stay there. And that's the key thing, because the brain can get stuck in a gear. Um, and we're supposed to move on from gear two to three and so on. But sometimes the brain gets stuck. And so there's a little lever in the car of your mind called but. And it says, but you, O Lord. So in other words, he's not just focusing on the problem. He's saying, you, Lord, are a shield for me. So in other words, he acknowledges who God is. And it's so important that we do the same thing because circumstances can weigh us down. But thank God for the garments of praise 
which overcomes the spirit of heaviness. And that's what the Bible says, he will give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so we need to acknowledge that God is God. All right, so we don't pretend the situation does exist, doesn't exist, but what we do is we acknowledge who God is. And this is part of our purpose. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, what does he say? He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light that we may show forth the praises of him who did that. We are to declare his praises. Amen? And so this is why it's always good to have a song in you that you can sing God's praises because sometimes you won't feel like just speaking them. You may need to sing them. Whatever it is, be determined to praise your God in whatever you're going through because praise itself is a weapon, a powerful weapon. God is enthroned, the Bible says, on the praises of his people. Well, I want God to be king in my circumstances, don't you? So we want to declare his praises. And that's so important. So don't stay with the problem. Acknowledge and declare who God is. And, you know, you have to understand that you sit in the heavenly places with him. And so you need also to take authority over your situation and begin to declare God's light into that situation and not to give up, but to continue proclaiming who God is you can just say, God is my light, he is the strength of my life, this too will pass, whatever it is, no weapon formed against me will prosper. You need to declare and have your mouth filled with his praises. Highlight those verses, write out those verses, have them ready in the time of need. All right, don't allow what's going on around you to totally change what's going on in you. Jesus was asleep in the boat. The disciples were panicking. He had perfect peace within himself. It is the world within you that ultimately matters. And the kingdom of God, that must be in you so that you can just release that as and when you need to. Can I hear a good amen? amen. So let us not complain. Let us proclaim who God is. Now let's get back to our passage. Exodus 16, and we're going to pick this up at verse 4, where it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And then it continues in verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So the Lord supernaturally provided food for them. And each morning, he sent this mysterious substance that would later be called manna. Everyone say manna. We'll come back to that word. Now, they were to gather one omer for each member of their family. And an omer is about two liters. So that's what their daily quota was, two liters or so per person. And then it continues in verse 17... 
Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. In other words, the more people in the family, the more you needed to gather. But it was two liters or so per person. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. So, they gathered the manna each morning. But what Moses said was, look, don't leave any of it till the next day. Now, why did he say that? It's because, well, God was testing them and because there would be no need to leave stuff till the next day because God would send more manna the next morning. So there was no need to. But, you see, they were you know, the Israelites, and you know how they carried on. And you, you can see it coming, especially if you've obviously already read much about them. Um, but God here was testing their faith. But unfortunately, they didn't pass the test. They failed. And so they left some of it in their unbelief till the next day. And as a result, it bred worms and it stank. And it's easy to, you know, point the finger at them and their unbelief, their failure to trust God. But if we are not careful, that same unbelief can manifest itself in our life. They were like, well, you know what? We don't know if God will do it again. He did it this morning, but you never know. So let's gather extra despite us being told not to. Um, but we can manifest that same unbelief. For example... If somebody holds on to what they have instead of giving it to God because they don't believe God will provide, that's the same unbelief. The same unbelief. And if you, if God puts something on your heart to do and you don't do it for fear of failure, well, that's the same level of unbelief. And we can all find ourselves, if we're not careful, being unbelieving believers, people who don't trust God. But that's not good. Let us not follow their example in this matter. Now, it continues in verse 21. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much Bread, and so it was on the sixth day, excuse me, that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you bake today, and boil what you boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. And so God told them, that there was a day where he would not send manna. And that day was the seventh day, the Sabbath. And what they were to do was to gather twice as much on the sixth day, because the next day, God said there will be no manna, so you need to gather twice as much for you to have on the Sabbath. And interestingly, when they did that, that extra did not breed worms or stink. And this is something clearly under God's control. God is testing them. And so it continues in verse 27. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather. 
but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commands and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So yet again, surprise, surprise, they were disobedient. But what motivated them to disobey God? Well, it was simple, skepticism. They wanted to see if there really would be no manna out there. They were still skeptical. And we can be like that. We can be skeptical if we are not careful. Despite the fact that God blatantly does something in our lives, we can still be like, was that really God? Or is there another explanation? And, you know, it can be comical reading about the Israelites here, but many Christians, believe you me, they are just as skeptical. God blatantly does something. Oh, was that really God? Or is that just me? Was that just my mind? And so we need to be careful that we are not slow to believe. Now, let us not be skeptical. These Israelites, despite God blatantly doing something for them, they were like, was that really God? Or was that just our imagination? And we can be like that. It amazes me. Do you notice how it's like the law of gravity? Your flesh has a tendency to be skeptical, to operate in unbelief. That's your flesh. Your spirit wants to trust God. It wants to know God. It wants to believe in Him. But your flesh is always trying to make you doubt. And it's amazing. Consider this strange substance, this manna. It's very strange. Why didn't God just send like a gigantic loaf of bread that we know something big and bold so that there could be no doubt you can touch it and it's firm they've never seen anything like this before but instead he sends something a bit weird a bit confusing a bit what exactly is this and God will often work in that way in your life it won't always be bam and obvious it will sometimes just be subtly but a bit strange that's how God often works now in verse 30 it continues, So the people rested on the seventh day, and the house of Israel called its name manna. Everyone say manna. The word manna means what is it? What is it? That's what it means. What is it? And that's what they called the food because they didn't know what it was. And it says, and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Then verse 35, And the children of Israel ate manna forty years until they came to an inhabitant, inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So this season of eating manna didn't last forever. Everyone say forever. forever. Now listen, there are times when God will do something in your life for a particular season. And there is a temptation to hold on to that which is past. And when it, God tells you it's time to move on, it's time to move on. You could have been seeking God, you could be praying in one particular way, and God says, okay, it's now time to change the way you pray. God never wants us to be dependent on a kind of system in our mind that when we think we've got God figured out. God refuses to allow you to put him in a box. Whenever you think you've got it, whenever you think you are, I, now I understand God, now I know how he works, you'll be like, really? And he will change it all up. And you, you see, what God wants is not mere adherence to some religious rituals. What he wants is a relationship with him. And it's an actual relationship. It's not some phrase that we just use because we use it. It is real. God will change things in your life so you can know him better. Now then, what I want to talk about though is why. Why did God take them through these 40 years of eating this manna? 
And why only then? Because once they got to the land of Canaan, they ate from the produce of the land. And they had to trust God now in a different way, and it changed. And, you see, I will say that again. Never demand that God deal with you in the same way he used to. Everyone say, it's time to grow. And that happens with all of us. There comes a point where we have to grow. And listen, if you don't listen, you must feel. Because look, there's many things God may try to warn you about, and it's not always obvious. It might be just here and there, give you a little hint, give you a warning. And we refuse to listen. And so God has to say very well, and it's because he loves you. He loves you too much to leave you the way you are, and he knows the potential that is in you and what he has called you to be. And listen, when God has called you to be something, and he's called all of you to be something, you will go through difficult times. It's part of the package. In your work, you get a package. You get benefits from that employment and so on. Guess what? One of the benefits from your employment in the kingdom of heaven is hard times. Everyone rejoice. I'm, I'm feeling the, the praise in the house at that wonderful news. And so listen, if you're in a tough season, my advice to you is this. Learn the lesson quick. Don't let that last any longer than it has to. All right? Don't, don't add to the duration. I know we're super spiritual here. We love the hard times because we grow. Woohoo! But look, they're not pleasant. All right? And so look, don't prolong it. Learn the lesson quick and cooperate with God. That's the best thing you can do. Now, what are the lessons that God was teaching them in this season? I want to mention four lessons. The first is this. God was teaching them to depend on Him. Now listen, depending on God, we all know we should depend on God, right? Wonderful, but often it's just a phrase. Listen, you don't depend on God until you're really dependent on God. I have been, over the past few years, in, in I guess, physically, emotionally, in a season of weakness, where I have not been my best self, as it were, in, in terms of my own mind. Listen, when you are weak, God is strong. You've got to understand that. I know what it is to be going through nonsense and have God operating on a level through me that is just mind-boggling. I'm like, whoa, this has nothing to do with me because right now, me, not so good. Yet God doing this, I mean, I know what it is to stand before you, preach, and receive a new message on the spot in totality, having had zero hours of sleep. Not even going to bed and not being able to sleep. Not even reaching bed, seeing the sun set and the sun rise. Having no right to any energy or power, and God just do his thing. I mean, I remember I was saying to Sylvia after one such ever, I said, that should not have happened. Zero sleep. Zero. I know what it is to be weak and God to do his thing. And I love it because it's blatantly God. And there's something invigorating about it being blatantly him and you can take no credit for it. When we are weak, he is strong. And look, he wants all of us <clears throat> to depend on him. Now in Matthew 6, 11, what did Jesus say? He said, give us this day our daily bread. Now look, here's the thing. Most of you have food in your cupboard right now for tomorrow. But so what's this prayer he told us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. You see, it's acknowledging dependence on him. All right, so even if you've got loads of food, pray it anyway. Give us this day our daily bread because we acknowledge that we depend on him. Now, here's the thing. The flesh, everyone say the flesh. And as long as you are in this Christian journey, you will have to deal with your flesh. All right? It doesn't go away. You get better at dealing with it, but it stays there. We look forward to the resurrection, amen, when we have a new body. But until that, in this life, we have this thing called the flesh, the sinful nature. And your flesh does not want to trust God. Now, let me tell you a secret. You may not want to read your Bible. You may not want to pray. You might not want to do the right thing. Well, listen, here's something you say to yourself. Simply say this. That is just my flesh. My spirit wants to. X, Y, Z. Read the Bible. Do what is right. Pray. 
That's just my flesh talking. You need to call it what it is. And when you say that, it brings into your consciousness your spiritual nature that wants to obey God. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Now, God is our Father. See, we want to be self-sufficient. God wants us to depend on Him. And look, what we are doing really is just following the pattern of our parents, Adam and Eve. Because what was the deal? What was this thing about not partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What was that really about? Well, you've he heard me say this to you before. I'll just say it quickly. When you read the book of Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, it tells us something. It tells us that God put trees in the garden and all of the trees, it says, were good for food and pleasant to the sight. It had those two attributes, every tree in the garden. Good for food, pleasant to the sight. But then, when it came to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God said to Adam, don't eat of that. Day you eat of it, you will die. Don't eat of that tree. When the devil, in the form of a serpent, tempted Eve, it says, and when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the sight, and desirable to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate, and then also gave to her husband who was with her. Adam really should have intervened, but that's another story. He was right there. But notice the difference with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like all the other trees, it was good for food and pleasant to the sight, but the one thing that distinguished it was this. It was desirable to make one wise. In other words, the temptation was, and it was a temptation that the devil spoke to Eve, and he said to her, listen, God knows that when you, everyone say you, now you can't see this in English, but in Hebrew, the word you there is in its plural form. In other words, the temptation was not just you, Eve, you and Adam. God knows that when you both eat of this, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil for yourself, basically. In other words, the temptation was that they would be their own source of wisdom, their own source of the knowledge of good and evil instead of depending on God for that information. That was the temptation. They would be independent. And that is contrary to God's ways for us. He wants us to be dependent on Him, not independent of Him. And the famous song, I did it my way, basically sums up the entire problem. We do it our way instead of depending on God and looking to Him for guidance. Let us invite God into every area of our lives to guide us and to lead us, and He will. Now, I want to read to you something that Moses later said in Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, but I'm going to read here from a Jewish translation, the JPS Tanakh translation. It says, He subjected you to the hardship of hunger and then gave you manna to eat, which neither you nor your fathers had ever known, in order to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but that man may live on anything that the Lord decrees. And I think that's an excellent rendering of that verse. What is going on there? You see, we have what we think life should be like. In other words, look, we think that we know what we need. I need this, I need that, I need the other. We think we know what we need, but you know what? You don't. Because the Israelites thought they needed one thing in the wilderness. They needed bread. But God says, no. You will live by whatever I decree you live by. And in that case, it was manna. You see, they didn't need what they thought they needed. What they needed is what God said they needed. And listen, some of you, you have no idea what you are capable of. You think you need certain things, but God, you see, you will have your conventional things that you think life should look like, but God will say, no, that's not what you need. What you're going to live by is whatever I decree. Whatever word comes from my mouth, that is going to settle the matter, and that's how you are going to function and live. And many, listen, 
Many, you may have certain things you think you need in your life, but God is going to come and say, no, you don't. What you need is me. And so, see the imperfections in your life as opportunities to get to know God more. Because now He's going to fill those areas of your life that you may think are void. And He will fill it with Himself, not with ice cream. That was a word right there. Ice cream tastes nice, don't get me wrong. But sometimes the apple pie will be good just by itself. God was teaching them to depend on Him. Now here's a second lesson. God was teaching them contentment. Everyone say contentment. Now notice He didn't send them five course meals in the wilderness. He didn't do that. In Philippians 3.19... Paul said, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. We need to be heavenly minded. That might not be a very popular thing to say. But we don't want to set our mind on earthly things. We don't want our belly to be our God. We need discipline and contentment. Paul went on to say in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he said, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Strength. I can do all of this. In other words, no matter what I'm facing, I can get through it victoriously through Jesus, through the strength that He gives me. I can get through whatever I am facing victoriously. Now you need to make that personal to whatever challenges you in your life. I can get through this victoriously. I can do all of this through Him who gives me strength. Everyone say strength. Amen. Now look, God's strength, that's a good strength because it's a strength that is undefeatable. And always ask God to strengthen you this day, strengthen you. Because that's what we need. We need strength. Because what do trials try to zap you of your strength they try to make you feel weary like you can't go on like this is just going to last forever you, what you need is strength inner strength now here's the next thing God was trying to teach them God was teaching them and this is important to obey even when it doesn't make sense or it doesn't seem to make sense it does make sense in God's economy, but not necessarily in ours. Now, what was all of this stuff about, you know, the Sabbath and, you know, why not be able to gather all, the, all that they want and have leftovers and so on? It doesn't matter. That's the way God wanted to do it. And listen, God will tell you to do things. If you're really radical about obeying Him, God will tell you to do things that don't seem to make sense. But the power is in the obedience. You've got to obey Him. And trust and obey, the song says, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And many people, they don't obey God because it doesn't make sense to them. Oh, why does the Bible say I can't do this, that, and the other? Who cares? You know, I used to say when God says jump, you say how high. But as you know, I testified earlier that I have to upgrade that. Um, to when God says jump, just jump. <laughs> you know, because sometimes the questions can be just a convenient excuse for procrastination. Amen? Now listen, here's the other thing I want to say. When you obey God, He often will not give you all the information up front. Okay? He will often just give you the next step. And faith, therefore, is stepping on that step when you don't see the whole staircase, as it has been said. So Samuel, that great prophet, 
God told him to go to Jesse's house and to anoint one of his sons as king, but Samuel didn't know who the king was until he saw David. But he obeyed. He went with the information he had and trust God to make everything else clear as and when it was needed. This is why, look, it's a relationship. Now, in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, what does it say? Trust in the Lord. Everyone say, the Lord. That's who we trust in. We do not trust in anyone else. And what I mean by that is putting our ultimate trust in other people. We ultimately trust in the Lord. And it says, with all, everyone say all. All your heart. Now, in other words, it's easy to sometimes trust him with, you know, a quarter or a half or three quarters. But he says, with all your heart. In other words, don't tolerate any doubt in your mind whatsoever. Let no doubt reside there. Let there be no section of your thinking that says, oh, well, what if God doesn't come through for me? No, no, no. Rid yourself of that. Have faith in God, Jesus said. Have faith. It's a choice. We choose to believe. We choose to doubt. You might say, I don't choose to doubt, I just do it. No, 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 you choose to. Because you choose to stay in doubt. You choose to not challenge doubt. You choose not to focus on Jesus and to focus on the storm instead. And so you find yourself beginning to sink. You don't deny the storm, but what you do, you focus on Jesus. You focus on Him. You focus on Him. Now, what did God say in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter something? <laughs> it might be chapter 7 or 6, one of those two. I will quickly see if I can find it, because this is an important key. And I hope you've been reading the book of Deuteronomy in those corporate readings. Do you remember the corporate readings? Yeah. Was, uh, mm. I, need, I need to maybe do a prize for people who do the corporate readings. We've been reading from the book of Deuteronomy together, um, chapter a day. Now, this is what God says, and I don't even know if I'll be able to find it. But um, it talks, it, it shares, and if I can't find it, I'll just paraphrase it. But it shares their basic key on how they would overcome fear. Because fear knocks on the door of every one of our hearts. But there's a key to overcoming fear. And he was talking to them about um, when they would go and conquer the lands and what they should do if they felt fearful. And what he said to them, good, I just came across it, verse 17 of chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, he said, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. Everyone say, you shall not. Now, the Bible says you shall not lie, right? You shall not bear false witness. You shall not steal. Those are commandments. This is a commandment. You shall not be afraid of them. So understand, you are in the military here. This is an order. Do not be afraid. And if you choose to be afraid, or if you allow yourself to be afraid, well, you are disobeying God. It's wrong. Do not be afraid of them, but, everyone say but. but, and admittedly but there in this translation is a translator supplied word, it's not there in the Hebrew, but even so it's useful for us because that word but is important, but you shall remember well, everyone say remember, remember. what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. So, what was the key for them not being afraid? Remembering. Remember what God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. So the key to overcoming fear is to remember God's faithfulness and what God has done. And we can look, yes, in our own life at his faithfulness and also to the powerful things he did in Scripture. And we can meditate on those. We can walk with Jesus in the Gospels and see him do all the things he did. And that can fill our minds with who God is. And we focus on that instead of how powerful the enemy might seem. Because when we focus on God, we realize he's a lot more powerful than whatever we are facing, and so that removes fear from us. And we choose now to embrace faith. Fear 
As is often said, false evidence appearing real. But I don't want to go there. I want to say, listen, fear makes you feel anxious. It robs you of strength. You see, it robs you of conviction. And listen, in Isaiah it said something like, if you do not believe, you will fall. And that was the encouraging word to the king when he was faced with this enemy. If you don't trust God, if you don't believe in him, yeah, you will be conquered. And consider, I won't turn to it, but Jeremiah chapter 1, what God said to Jeremiah. And listen, God deals with his soldiers in a very tough manner. He can be very gentle, but he can be very tough. And he said to Jeremiah, who was a young guy, he said to him, look, do not be dismayed before them or I will dismay you before them. In other words, Jeremiah, if you're going to be afraid, I will make you afraid. If you're going to fear them, Jeremiah, I will make you be afraid of them. In other words, there are times when, yes, God has been gentle with us, but there comes a time of war where God says, look, you ain't got time for those kind of feelings. You haven't got time to entertain those thoughts. You're going to be afraid? Well, then be afraid and you will be defeated. But now is the time to be strong. And that's what Paul says. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. In other words, this is not playtime. This is wartime. And in this battle, you need to choose strength or you will be defeated. Can I hear a good amen? amen? Now then, God was teaching them to obey him. Even when it doesn't make sense. Now... Here's the fourth and final lesson that I want to point out. God was teaching them that he is able to sustain them even when they feel vulnerable. And this is an important lesson. Because they were vulnerable in the wilderness. They were vulnerable to attack. They didn't have the stability of being able to live from the produce of the lands. They were vulnerable But our faith needs to be strong, not only when things are good, but when things are difficult and uncertain and not easy. Consider Paul in 1 Timothy 6.17. He said, command, you're speaking to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Everyone say haughty. So in other words, their riches can make them feel self-sufficient. It can make them feel, you know, and listen, let me say this to you. One of the biggest dangers for a Christian is success. Success can be very deceiving because it can make you think all is well with you. Because things are well. Now, (laughs) Paul, bless his soul. What a thing he went through. Now, this is the great Apostle Paul. Now, he was a blessed man, amen? Okay, good. Now, hear what he said. He said, listen, till this day, I suffer this. He says, I've suffered shipwreck. I've been beaten, naked, hungry. (laughs) Is this the blessed life, Paul? Aren't you glad he didn't monitor the extent to which he was blessed by how perfect his circumstances were. I mean, imagine traveling with him. He had to write to Timothy and say, listen, don't be ashamed of my sufferings. In other words, what he went through was so bad with his imprisonment that he could have made Timothy embarrassed. You know, we serve this mighty God, right? Well, what, what's Paul doing in prison? What, why is Paul beaten? I mean, actually beaten. I mean... Paul, he said to the Galatians that it was because of a physical infirmity that he preached the gospel to them. In other words, he had planned on going elsewhere, it seems, but a physical ailment prevented him from doing so, and so he preached to the Galatians, and he said, you didn't despise despise my infirmity. In fact, you would have plucked out your own eye and given them to me, he said. They didn't despise him. So he wasn't living in ideal circumstances all the time, Paul. He had it really difficult. But yet God used him. Yet he walked with God. And so look, Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Listen, 
sometimes we can in, in the, and I know obviously things are very difficult here too, but even so we in this country are, one of, are in one of the more wealthy countries. And you know, people can think that, oh, we need to go and help you know, some church in some other distant place as though we are more blessed than them. Never think that material well-being means you're more blessed than someone who's in a very difficult situation. Let's not be haughty. And he says, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Everyone say uncertain riches. But in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So now notice, here's what I want you to see. Riches, by their very nature, are uncertain. And listen, circumstances are uncertain. Your faith must not be in circumstance, in good circumstances. A good economy is uncertain. Living in a post-war country is uncertain. And we've seen trouble, you know, and things can change very quickly. Our faith must not be in how ideal circumstances are. Our faith must be in the living God who is able to sustain us by whatever He decrees we should be sustained by. There's no guarantee that this country will not be in a great war within our lifetimes. We don't know the future. We, we can't assume. But things can change very, very quickly. And we need to make sure that when things are going well, our faith is not in those good circumstances, but is in the living God. In other words, the more success you have is the more you need to humble yourself before God. The more you need to actively do things that you may think are beneath you. Because you must stay humble. The devil, pride, comes from him. And he, what we are told in Isaiah chapter 14, we are told about the devil. He said, I will be like the Most High. He said, I, I'm, I'll be exalted above the throne of God. I'll be like the Most High. And here's the irony. You see, he said, I will be like the Most High. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, there is a war. Michael and his angels versus the devil and his angels. And Michael and his angels defeat the devil and his angels. And do you know what Michael's name means? The name Michael? It means who is like God. You see the irony there? So the devil said, I will be like the Most High. And God sends who is like God to defeat him. God will always have the last laugh. But pride is something that will rob you of God's blessing. You don't want any pride in your life. And because God loves you, if you have pride in your life, he will quickly show you how foolish that is. Humble yourself rather than be humbled by God. Never pray for your pastor that God will humble me. Please don't. It's not a pretty picture when God humbles someone. You're better off humbling yourself. Now, in Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul said, Be in confidence of this very thing, that he... Everyone say confident. Now, listen, it's so easy just to skip that word. Confident. So he didn't say casually know this. He didn't say just be aware of this somewhere in your brain. He said be confident of this. So we're to be confident about something. About what? He said, of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So listen, God has begun a work in you, amen? Now the fact that he's begun a work in you must mean he's up to something. He's up to something in your life. You may feel like you're just existing or going day by day, but listen, he's doing a work in you. He's begun a work. And he says, now you need to be confident about the fact that this work he's begun in you is something he will complete. He will finish it. 
And listen, he's not finished with you yet. He's still working in you. And you have to be confident. And this is what you can say when things are coming against you. You can say, no, hold on a minute. God who began a work in me, I am confident that he's going to finish it. This situation is not going to be the end of me. God will finish what he started. In fact, I will say this. God doesn't start something until he's finished it. You see, we start something and then finish it, but God doesn't start until he's already finished. <laughs> and you've heard me talk about that. I'll, you know, Paul says we glorify past tense already, even though it hasn't happened yet in time. God doesn't start until he's already finished. And so we can be confident that what he has begun in us, he will complete. And here's another thing we can be confident. Romans 8, 28. We know the verse. And we know, everyone say no, that all things, everyone say all things, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. All things means all things. Nothing you have heard me say before is wasted. When Jesus, what did I say? He broke, he divided the bread, fed the multitude, and he got his disciples to gather up all the crumbs and stuff that remains. Nothing is wasted. Nothing we go through is wasted. Nothing is wasted. It may not be on our plan. It may not be what we thought life would look like. Who, who cares? So what? God's going to use it for his glory. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And I love the fact that it has the word the before called. The called according to his purpose. In other words, there's a group of people who are the called. And you are part of that group. The only reason you believe in Jesus is because God called you to himself. You cannot respond to Christ without God calling you to him. It's impossible. No one comes to the Father unless he is drawn. No one comes to the Son except the Father draws that person to him. You are the called. And then finally, Romans 8, 38 to 39, Paul says, For I am persuaded, everyone say persuaded, so we've got confident, we've got knowing, and now we have persuaded. He's been persuaded by somebody. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing. And finally, I said finally, but I'm going to read something to you. I need to read because he said we can't be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, watch closely what, what Romans chapter 5 says, Paul writing about trials that we go through. But he had something incredibly important to say. And so it begins... We don't need to read verse 1. I'm currently on one of those pages that is just almost... Oh, there we are. It's opening up now. Good. So he says in verse 3... Ah, verse 1. <laughs> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing stuff there through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So yes, we are rejoicing about what waits us when Christ comes and we share in Christ's glory. We rejoice in hope of that glory. Wonderful. But then he said, verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Everyone say also so in addition to rejoicing about what awaits us in the future, we also rejoice, we also glory in tribulations, in trouble. And notice that he didn't say in tribulation, singular, he said in tribulations, plural, help. What, where are we going, Paul? He says, we glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces Perseverance, or we could say endurance. And perseverance, character. That's approved character. 
Hallelujah. Character is such an important thing. It's talking about proved character. It's like a soldier who has been through certain wars and therefore receives a certain status in the army, some kind of recognition. When you've been through tribulations with God, it produces a strength in you that you could not have had unless you had gone through that thing. It's as though it activates something in you that could not have been activated without having gone through that trouble. And you become stronger. Just like a weightlifter becomes stronger through what they do in the gym, and they have the muscles to prove it, you become stronger through going through tough times with God. Character, and character produces Hope. Now hold on a minute. Why does character produce hope? Because character proves God faithful in the midst of tough times. And so hope in the New Testament is not talking about how we use the word hope today where, you know, I sure hope my team wins the match. Or I, 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 I sure hope so. Hope in the New Testament is a confident word. It's the certain expectation of good and character, having been through warfare, having been through tribulation and come through victoriously, it produces in you an expectation that good is going to come out of this trial. Because you've, got the proof, you've been through it. It produces in you hope. And watch this, now hope does not disappoint. In other words, this is not false hope. And God will never give you false hope. I'm glad that God has told me when going through something, he's made it very clear, no, I'm not going to reverse this, this is going to happen. He has not given me false hope, and I'm grateful for that. But the hope that God does give does not disappoint. In other words, it's not about you getting all hopeful and then being let down. That's not the hope that God gives. But the hope that God gives does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now listen, this is amazing stuff. Because what the Holy Spirit does, what is His function in your life? One of the functions, I'll just say, the function of the Holy Spirit is to let your heart know how much God loves you. Listen, the devil comes with condemnation, but the Holy Spirit comes with an assurance that God is in love with you. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And listen, never think the Holy Spirit is the spirit that brings condemnation or a kind of fear that keeps you from approaching God. The Holy Spirit is the God, is the spirit who inspires within you the cry, Abba, Father. He is the spirit that inspires within you an awareness that God, God loves me. And because I know He loves me, I know He has a good plan for my life. Listen, I'm getting excited. I need to calm down and finish this message quickly. I'm struggling to stay seated. Goodness me, this is, I guess, why I in discipline sit and then always end up going back to standing. God help me. But God loves us. And He never confused condemnation for the Holy Spirit. It's not Him. That's the devil. Yes, the Holy Spirit convicts, but when the Holy Spirit convicts, it always draws you nearer to God. It never draws you further away from Him or makes you feel that God doesn't love you. He does. And I'm grateful that in the midst of my error, in the midst of my messing up, God has made it clear. He has come and spoken to me and assured me of His love. For me, and it's a love, I'm telling you, it doesn't make you want to think that you can just continue sinning and get away with it. No, no, no. It's a love that inspires you to love God back and to obey Him. Stand with me, please. I'm going to pray. Do forgive me, I haven't done the summary. I've had feedback that that's important. Let me read the summary very quickly. 
We must be on guard against irrational thoughts and unbelief when we hold on to what we have instead of giving it to God and avoid doing what God has laid on our heart because we fear failure. We are operating in unbelief. God wants us to depend on him and to be content. We are to obey even when it doesn't seem to make sense. Our faith in God must remain strong in unstable times. God is able to sustain us even when we feel vulnerable. Bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, we will sing your praises. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that you have adopted us as your dear children. Thank you for the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit inspires us to run to you, to call you Dad. We thank you that you are our Father and we are your true children. And because of that, Father, we depend on you. We look to you for our provision. Give us this day and day by day our daily bread. Lord, thank you that you are our source. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you give us richly all things to enjoy. We thank you, Lord, for your hand of favor on our lives. We thank you that your face shines upon us. Yes, your light shines upon us, Father. We thank you that in Christ we are favored, we are accepted in the Beloved. He is the Beloved, we are in Him, and we are accepted by you. Father God, you are our Father, you love us. We thank you that you rejoice over us with singing. We thank you that you who have begun a good work in us will complete it. We thank you that you do not start until you have finished. We thank you that you have chosen us, predestined us, called us, justified us, glorified us, and that now we sit with Christ in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power. We thank you that we've been raised with him. We thank you that we will reign with him, if indeed we are faithful to you and suffer with him. We thank you, Lord, that you are using the circumstances in our lives to bring out the gold in us. We thank you that even now, Lord, you are trying us as gold is refined. You are removing impurities from our thinking. You are removing inferior mindsets. You are upgrading our thinking so that we think heaven's thoughts, so that we think and set our minds on things above, so that we think that we are more than conquerors through Christ, so that we think that nothing can separate us from the love of God, so that we think that that no weapon formed against us will prosper, so that we think that despite our challenges, you are our shield, you are our glory, you are the lifter up of our heads. Lord, despite what we are going through, our God reigns. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. To you be the glory. To you be the praise and the honor. To you be all praise, O oh God, because you are the mighty one. You do not change. And so, Father, I commend to you all whose hearts are troubled at this time. Father, I pray that your light will shine in their hearts and dominate their thinking. I thank you that what they are going through, they will not go through forever. The manna was but for a season. They entered the land of Canaan and ate the fruit thereof. And I pray that all those who are going through long-standing situations, that they will enter their land of Canaan and and enjoy the fruit thereof. They will enter their land that flows with milk and with honey. Oh, hallelujah. Praise be to the, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies, the victorious one, the one who is undefeated, the man of war, God himself. Praise be to you, Father. Oh, Lord, you are good. We bless and we praise your name. 
Oh, hallelujah. The Lord wants to release praise in your battle. The battle is not yours, it is his. He wants you simply to praise him, to praise him like you've lost your mind, to praise him like you are besides yourself. You need to bring on that praise. You need to clap when you don't feel like clapping. You need to jump when you don't feel like jumping. You need to shout when you don't feel like shouting because the battle is not yours. It is God's. Father, I thank you that this praise, that when we bless you, it brings us strength. It brings us strength, Lord. And I thank you that hope does not disappoint because your love has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit you have given to us. In other words, Father, your love assures us that you have a good purpose for our lives. Your love assures us that all things will work together for good. Nothing will be wasted. Hallelujah. Let us give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah.